One person whose influence ripples more through the medium of anime than anyone else is Osamu Dezaki. With a career almost spanning the length of the industry itself, Dezaki's influence can be seen in any anime you watch today. I can almost guarantee you're well aware of his visual quirks that show up in most of today's series, and they trace all the way back to the earliest works of Osamu Dezaki. Unfortunately, his more obscure older library and his lack of success in the West compared to other names means that he's not nearly as well celebrated as his peers. Which is a tremendous shame, Dezaki was one of the most creative and influential minds the medium has ever seen, and he deserves a lot more recognition. I'd like to take you through his career, having a look at his style and influence, to see how Osamu Dezaki became one of anime's great visionaries. The beginning of Dezaki's career very much coincides with the beginning of the TV anime industry. Dezaki joined Mushi Productions in 1963, a lead animation studio at the time, who were just about to kickstart the industry with Tezuka's Astro Boy. Dezaki quickly made a name for himself here and began directing episodes of various TV series, starting with that very series. He was 19 at the time and at the forefront of the anime revolution. Unfortunately, we don't know which episodes of Astro Boy Dezaki directed, but we do for the later Dororo, which he worked on as episode director for three episodes. Dororo works as a nice precursor insight into his later style as a director. A lot of his trademark techniques are birthed in this period. Remember, this is the 60s, where TV anime has only been around for a few years and most creators are still finding their stylistic feet. A lot of the shows at the time are very flat, almost just animated manga panels. Creators had no real source of influence inside the medium. They didn't have decades of prior anime to take from. Influence instead would come from popular manga, Disney movies, or in Dezaki's case, cinema. He was heavily influenced by film. Movements like the French New Wave were in their prime at this time. And over in Japan, directors like Akira Kurosawa had just spent the last 20 years making some of cinema's greatest films. It was an enormous source of influence for the young Dezaki. This shows immediately in the first episode Dezaki directs for Dororo. The opening few minutes are packed with cinematic techniques. Strong, realistic use of lighting, a very prominent use of depth of field, and camera movements that mimic a physical camera. There's even this shot here which shows a silhouette effect, but one that would be made by a camera, retaining some of the detail. It's clear Dezaki was coming from a different angle to the rest of the industry. At the time, TV anime was, for the most part, either Tezuka or Tezuka ripoffs, all of which were heavily influenced by the manga they were adapting, leaving Dezaki to become a pioneer in a lot of his techniques. Dezaki's unique use of graphics shine through here too, like this shot of the sun in episode 6 or the use of mist in the following fight scene. As you'll see in further examples in future projects, he was a master at using tricks like this to do more with less. Dezaki was inexperienced and young, but a true talent already and completely unique in his sphere. Dezaki was claiming the Mushi Pro ladder and had higher-ups impressed with his work as an episode director. It wasn't long until Dezaki was given the opportunity to direct his first full project, Ashita no Joe, in 1970. Joe was Dezaki's opportunity to make a name for himself and really make an impact on the medium. But what he did in these early years was more than anyone at the time could have imagined. He didn't stick closely to the already popular Joe manga as he adapted it, instead continuing on with his own vision of the series, which paid off as the series was a huge success and at the young age of 27, Dezaki was becoming one of the biggest names in the industry. When looking at Joe, it's important to remember how narrow TV anime was stylistically at the time. A quick look at some of the other shows airing during this time gives you a, a good idea of what was happening. Dezaki continued embracing his cinematic influence with Joe, giving characters more realistic body proportions and highly detailed expressions. The use of lighting here is very impressive. The opening episode, for example, takes place at sunset and we have these very long, dynamic shadows that create a unique sense of tension. Dezaki treats his animated works like real film sets. I mentioned at the time that a lot of anime were very flat, much like how early cinema was flat. Most practitioners were just animating manga panels. Dezaki revolutionised this in his works by giving everything a 3D perspective, as if he was really animating a film set with real cameras. This is extremely effective with his integration of multi-layered background movement. Dezaki would use multiple layers of backgrounds and move them all differently to create a three-dimensional shot. This is such a huge step forward in the technicality of anime. His use of surreal graphics that I touched upon in Dororo start to develop in Joe 2. For example, this shot of a painted background during a fight. In a bid to save money, 
a lot of shows would use block colours or basic shapes as backgrounds. It would save staff a lot of time in having to paint a whole background. Dezaki twisted this around and uses these backgrounds to draw focus in certain areas and heighten drama. This later becomes one of Dezaki's most well-known contributions to the medium, postcard memories. Dezaki would end dramatic sequences with a close-up of a face, which developed into taking that close-up and transitioning it into a painted, detailed still. These saved a lot of time in animation and became iconic in his shows, as they worked as a fantastic way of representing drama. Postcard memories become a staple of his style, which you'll see developing in his later works, and still today many shows use them to climax their episodes. The still enormously influential Tezuka had left Mushi Pro, and the studio was facing huge financial problems, and just as the company was about to file for bankruptcy, Tezaki left and joined the newly birthed Studio Madhouse. This is where he would create his next hit, 1973's Aim for the Ace, one of anime's early great sports stories. Dezaki's fantastic use of melodrama shined here, and he injected the series with his ever-improving visual surrealism. His surreal imagery becomes the stylistic backbone for Aim for the Ace, making it one of the most unique works of its time. Dezaki takes his technique of coloured backgrounds from Joe and develops them into the show's main aesthetic. The backgrounds are never grounded in realism, usually playing with colour schemes and mixing them with non-literal elements. Even small details are fantasised, like having sparkles accompanying a character's face during a dramatic scene. He uses colour and differing detail to draw our eyes onto certain parts of the screen, and this is really smart. Not only does it work as an efficient storytelling tool, but unnecessary detail can be replaced with elements that are much easier to animate. It was a win-win. This style is continued into Dezaki's later shoujo works and becomes one of his most influential contributions to the medium. I'll touch on this in more detail shortly. One of the biggest developments in Aim for the Ace was Dezaki's smart use of animation. We discussed his postcard memories technique that appears in Joe, which is further solidified in Aim for the Ace. Stills are used prominently through the episode at dramatic moments, similarly with Dezaki's use of repetition, playing the same few frames over and over again to increase impact. They might look pretty basic now, but at the time, Dezaki was revolutionary in his resourcefulness. This made Osamu Dezaki one of the most valuable creators in a time of little stability in the industry. After a few quieter years, Dezaki directed Nobody's Boy Remy in 1978, also at Madhouse. Remy was a hit, especially overseas where Dezaki had found little success in the past. It was by far his most technically impressive show yet. He took his multi-layered background technique and took it to a whole new level of complexity. Remy is arguably the catalyst for how later anime would use dynamic backgrounds. Dezaki was masterful in how he perfectly moved each layer of his world, each movement complementing its counterpart parts, creating a mesmerising viewing experience, and combined with the rich colour scheme, produces a fairy tale atmosphere that just couldn't be achieved by anyone else. This dynamic movement gave Dezaki a chance to further play with his cinematic influence, as he could replicate real cameras even more so than before. This scene where Remy's father comes home, for example, creates such unease as the camera pans in ways that flat animation just couldn't. It creates fantastic perspective shots and tells you everything you need to know about the situation. This technique becomes one of the pillars of later animation in Japan. It allowed creators to birth vibrant, exciting scenes on a small budget. All of Dezaki's experience and skill would be fully utilised in his next project, The Rose of Versailles in 1979. Dezaki didn't begin directing the series, he oversaw production of the first half, but stepped in at around episode 20 to direct the second half. The staff listing for the series was a collaboration of some of the industry's finest talents, and, and under the direction of Dezaki they made an unmistakable classic. The series was a massive hit, and still remains one of the best dramas in the medium. Versailles is credited as a main inspiration for shows like Ikuhara's revolutionary girl Utena, which went on to influence a whole wave of anime in the following decades. It's also credited as one of the main influences on shows favouring a more solidified, serious storyline, as well as progressing shoujo anime tremendously. Versailles' influence is not to be underestimated. The series can be seen as a perfection of Dezaki's style in the 70s. All the techniques that he created over the past decade are used here to perfection. The multi-layered movement, for example, is done with such skill that it's barely noticeable. Everything just moves naturally, creating a look that fits more in line with a series of a, a few decades later. 
I think his general directing ability reaches a similar level of excellence as well. Look at this scene where a number of characters meet on a beach. What stands out first is the biblical presentation of the sky behind, with streaks of light crashing down onto the world and the masterfully animated sea in the background, wetting the sand to mirror the scene in a reflection on the floor. All of this becomes foundation for the presentation of the characters. Dezaki flawlessly frames these characters at different perspectives to show authority and importance. The scene is perfect and just the start of Dezaki's expert visual input into the series. And Versailles is packed with moments like this in every episode, giving a whole new layer of awe to the story. It's so easy to get lost in the visual presentation of the show. He was one of the first directors from this era that were really using their medium to tell stories. Versailles in the following years can be considered Dezaki's most prolific in terms of output, essentially creating a whole new project every year, starting the decade with a second season of Joe, and then a follow-up movie for Joe, and then one for Remy, but it was 1982 that saw a change in direction for Dezaki. This echoed a change in the industry as well, the late 70s had caused a shift in the market and anime was about to go sci-fi mad. With shows like Gundam and Macross on the brink of a volcanic popularity, Dezaki was right there waiting and start production on his new series, Space Adventure Cobra. This is possibly an overlooked period in Dezaki's career because it doesn't line up as much with the rest of his work, but it's fair to say that Dezaki contributed to the boom of sci-fi anime during the 80s, and what a contribution it was. Cobra was completely different in tone to Dezaki's previous works. You have a cheeky James Bond type who fumbles his way through sci-fi punch-ups in pursuit of cyborg women. It's full of nicely implemented comedy, beautifully designed locations, and action scenes that make it impossible to stop watching. Techniques like his multi-layered backgrounds are standard now, and Dezaki makes them blend in with his complex futuristic world perfectly. The sci-fi setting also allows Dezaki to play around with objects like hologram screens and neon lighting. This is one of Cobra's most interesting aesthetic values, as many of the shots are pointed through glass or presented as reflections, and you can see this is something Dezaki's wanted to do for a long time. Joe had a similar kind of effect in the city scenes. Space Adventure Cobra is the realisation of all our science fiction dreams, and without a doubt one of Dezaki's most exciting works. A year later, in 1983, Dezaki directed Golgo 13, an action movie about a silent hitman. It was scarcely released in the West, and it seems only hard core Dezaki fans have put the effort into searching out a copy, which is a shame because I think a lot of the scenes in this movie are some of Dezaki's best, and the film is just paced brilliantly. There's constant action, violence and sex throughout the film's runtime, accompanied with countless scenes of impressive animation. This was one of the first anime films ever to incorporate CG animation, a whole decade before the rest of the industry would join in. It was only used for one scene in Golgo, but a quick look at that scene shows that the rest of the industry were probably right to wait. From now on, Dezaki became very selective with the projects he would take on. For example, The Mighty Orbots in 1984, or Bionic 6 in 1987, an American cartoon that was no doubt trying to replicate the success of mecha anime in Japan in America. But they did retain his very unique style, and they're great to watch. Although in the early 90s, Dezaki returned to his more traditional style with Onisama E. This has more similarities to his early works like Aim for the Ace than it does to any of his recent projects. After this, Dezaki's output slows down, he's no longer making a whole TV series every year, instead opting for OVAs or movies. That's not to say his quality drops. Movies like Blackjack are a fantastic use of his developed style, giving the Tezuka adaptation an interesting darker tone. He even takes his skills to a whole new genre and directs two key adaptations, a movie for Air in 2005 and one for Clanad in 2007, using a new generation of animators to bring his visions to life. This is a showcase of Dezaki's unlimited scope. From being an episode director on Astro Boy all the way back in 1963, Dezaki has done everything. He revolutionised the medium that he loves and made it his own. Every project he worked on was filled with creativity and innovation. Tragically, Dezaki passed away in 2011, but this doesn't mean he won't continue to impact anime. His presence lives on with his influence in every anime that comes out today. Many of anime's most prolific directors over the last decade or two, Kunihiko Ikuhara, Akiyuki Shimbo, all owe their style directly to Dezaki. We now have whole genres and styles that are birthed from his vision. Without Dezaki, who knows if anime would be the exciting medium it is today. And I hope this video has done a good enough job at showing how important he was to anime. 
Next time you watch a new anime series, keep an eye out for the techniques and visual styles that Dezaki introduced. You'd be really surprised, and I hope you did enjoy this video as well. It's the most fun I've had making a video in ages, and there's a lot more videos coming soon. Um, so please do subscribe, there's a lot of really great stuff coming up, and keep an eye out on the channel. And if you enjoyed this video, of course, click the like button. If you haven't already, you can also follow me on social media like Twitter and Facebook. I'm quite active on those as well. But thank you very much for watching this video.